the Chernobyl accident left its mark on history. Many of those who were touched by the disaster faced it unwillingly, but there were also those who deliberately took risks to protect others from the deadly danger that threatened the entire continent. I'm talking about the responders. Among them are the firefighters who came to put out the hot reactor, and the plant personnel who worked the fateful shift on the night of April 26, and the miners who tunneled under the reactor. They are all heroes, of course, but who was the first victim of the peaceful atom and why has he not been found yet? On the night of April 26, the duty shift of the Chernobyl station was conducting an experiment. The employees wanted to find out whether it was possible to use the energy of the turbine generator for their own needs, for example, in case of an accident. The successful outcome of this experiment promised good bonuses to the employees and a state medal for significant contribution to the director. What happened then, the whole world knows. The nuclear reactor and the reactor hall, buildings as tall as a 20-story building, were destroyed. On the site of Unit 4, a nuclear volcano crater with a temperature of 5,000 degrees Celsius was formed. It was enough to turn metal into liquid mud and graphite into smoldering embers. Isotopes of death were being released into the air. Radioactivity was in places 30,000 Rentgens per hour. The Chernobyl catastrophe was equal in radiation level to 350 Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosions, dropped at the same time. Such a catastrophe has never happened on our land before. The first days of the Chernobyl apocalypse saw the emergence of the first heroes, people who, at the cost of their lives, saved us all from an imminent catastrophe. It is worth emphasizing that all firefighting crews involved in extinguishing the fire were already doomed. None of the firefighters were aware of the deadly levels of radiation. Young and strong firefighters who climbed to the roof to extinguish the fire could not get down from the roof on their own. That same night, two fishermen were sampling fish near the burning engine room building. No one knew how it would turn out. They got 400 x-rays each. Toward morning, they got very sick. The heat was burning them from the inside out. Overnight, the fishermen got a black nuclear tan. And by the evening of April 27, about 100 people were in the hospital in Pripyat. It was acute radiation sickness. The first casualties. No one realized that a radiation field was developing around the hour. By this time everything in Pripyat and the surrounding area was poisoned. No one was in a hurry to evacuate. The country's leadership was afraid of panic. To date, it is difficult to calculate the exact number of people who suffered from the consequences of the accident, but through thoroughly unknown how many people fell ill, how many were undermined in health as a result of radiation exposure. There are only approximate data. However, it is known for sure that the number of those affected is in the thousands. All because the release of radioactive materials led to the contamination of huge territories. At one time, the World Health Organization published a report according to which about 4,000 people died as a result of cancers provoked by the Chernobyl disaster. The problems here are the radiation contamination of vast areas of Europe, Asia, and even Africa. The UN estimates that about 16,000 people have died from cancers caused by Chernobyl fallout. The Russian Academy of Sciences puts the figure at 200,000 people, and Ukraine's National Commission on Radiation Protection says 500,000 people. These figures continue to grow. More recently, another estimate of 1 million people has appeared. If this is true, Chernobyl is the deadliest disaster in history since the Chinese attacks of 1931. By comparison, the atomic bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima killed no more than 230,000 people. This means that a small flaw in the atomic plant was more deadly than the bloody finale of the most brutal war in human history. It is commonly believed that the first victims of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant were the firefighters who went to extinguish Unit 4, but this is not quite true. Firefighters are rather referred to the first victims, but the first victim is considered to be the Chernobyl NPP worker Valery Kodomchuk. He was the lead operator of the circulation pumps. To understand what happened to him, you need to know what was happening a minute before the accident, and only those who were there can know that. And thank God that there were indeed survivors of the accident. 
According to eyewitness accounts, Valery Kodumchuk, a reactor shop operator, was at his post right next to the reactor during the cancerous night shift. Main Circulation Pump Room At 1.23 a.m. he went to check the pumps, after which the explosion occurred. That night, despite the danger of being in the destroyed hall of Unit 4, Kodumchuk's colleagues tried to find him for several hours in a row, in the blackness of the rooms with blocked entrances and exits, in the rumble of collapses, suffocating from smoke and radioactive dust, but the search was unsuccessful. They didn't find him. And after that, in spite of the fact that all the rubble of Unit 4 has been studied quite thoroughly, where the station worker went, is still a mystery. According to some liquidators and managers of the liquidation of the accident consequences, because of high temperatures, about 6,000 degrees Celsius, the body of Valery Kodumchuk simply vaporized, and it is impossible to find him. Hence the question, can radiation really dissolve a person? If we look at some historical facts, it will become clear that radiation may well vaporize a person. Remember, for example, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Near the epicenter of the explosion, most living things were instantly turned into vapor. Shadows on the parapets of people were imprinted even half a mile east of the epicenter. All that was left of the people, except those sitting on the rocks that didn't melt, were handfuls of black shadows. In the left photo you can see the steps of the main entrance to Sumitomo Bank, which is located just 250 meters from the epicenter. The man was probably sitting on the steps facing the epicenter, perhaps waiting for the bank to open. The high temperatures of a thousand degrees Celsius or more caused by the explosion burned the man alive, leaving only a shadow. Ten years after the explosion, the shadow had almost disappeared from the steps, but when it rained, it slowly showed up. The right photo shows the shadows made by thermal radiation. At a distance of about 800 meters from the epicenter, the unprotected asphalt was scorched, leaving shadows of handrails and columns, a characteristic feature of atomic bomb thermal radiation. A tremendous amount of heat is released in a very short time, about three seconds after detonation. There is virtually no heat loss, as the air is instantly heated, its thermal conductivity increasing dramatically. Within a radius of one kilometer from the epicenter there were cases when even roof tiles melted and foamed. Why shadows after the explosion were left by people or objects through which the light radiation passed as through an obstacle? This phenomenon is similar to the appearance of an ordinary shadow in the path of light, when objects turn out to block the surface behind them from radiation. But the intensity of radiation in a nuclear explosion is so high that the structure of objects changes, asphalt becomes darker, paint burns out, and granite becomes rough. There is another opinion that no one could have been vaporized in the explosion, and this is easy to calculate. The energy of the Hiroshima baby bomb was 63 terajoules. It takes more than 0.2 gigajoule of energy to vaporize a person, hence a person would have to be less than 150 meters from the epicenter of the blast. In Japan, however, the nuclear explosion was atmospheric and produced at an altitude clearly greater than 150 meters. The origin of the shadows on the walls and on the road does not require human vaporization. The impact radiation from the explosion lasts for about a microsecond and burns the surface of the walls of houses. If a person moved between the wall and the epicenter of the blast during this time, his or her shadow appears on the wall. The radiation turns the burned body of the person, and a clear image of the last moment of his movement just before the explosion against the background of the melted wall remains on the wall or road. During the explosion, people who were in the path of the huge light radiation were either burned alive or charred, and then the shock wave threw them off, leaving their bodies on the surface. In the case of Chernobyl and the missing plant workers, this has nothing to do with it, because at Chernobyl during the accident, the high temperature was only at the bottom of the reactor itself where the molten fuel flowed. However, this was a very small area, and a person would hardly have gotten there, given the steam explosion, which would have scattered him even farther away from the reactor. Besides, there was a steam explosion, not a nuclear explosion. Eyewitnesses claim that Unit 4 was destroyed by two explosions. The second most powerful explosion, which occurred a few seconds after the first, is thought to have been caused by the rupture of a tube in the cooling system caused by the rapid evaporation of water. The water or vapor reacted with the zirconium and the fuel elements, producing a large amount of hydrogen, causing it to explode. 
Swedish scientists say that during the Chernobyl accident in reality it was a nuclear explosion of about 75 tons of TNT equivalent that occurred. For this purpose, they modeled the accident with a special program, using detailed data for 1986. In addition, the physicists cite three more evidences in favor of their hypothesis. First, after the explosion, it was found that in the southeast quadrant of the core and reactor disappeared 2-meter serpentine slab, encased in an iron shell about 4 centimeters thick. Further observations showed that it had been melted by thin directed streams of high-temperature plasma that could have been generated by the nuclear explosion. Secondly, immediately after the accident, seismologists registered two signals with amplitudes corresponding to a power of about 200 tons and separated by a two-second interval. The second explosion can be explained by the release of hydrogen. The accepted theory of the first explosion gives a much lower estimate for the power. Third, several eyewitnesses have stated that they saw a bright blue flash above the reactor. However, no matter how hard foreign scientists try, the explosion was thermal. As a result of rising steam pressure above the allowable vapor pressure in the reactor core cooling system, the explosion ruptured the core, partially destroying the reactor building while scattering fragments of uranium rods hundreds of meters around. These fragments of nuclear fuel and fission reaction products contaminated the environment. A nuclear explosion in nuclear reactors is impossible in principle because there are no conditions for reaching critical mass. Consequently, Kodumchuk's disappearance will have to be explained by other versions. Everyone knows that the plaque in memory of Valery Kodumchuk is installed in the block, at the entrance to the corridor that leads to the former hall of the northern circulation pumps. Currently, this corridor is completely filled with concrete. Former employees of the station recall one curious moment. They claim that the first firefighters to arrive to extinguish the fire at Unit 4 saw a body in white near the rubble that had formed on the site of the North Circulation Pump Room. The firefighters thought the man was dead because the body was not moving. They decided to carry him out of there only after the fire was extinguished. However, as we know, the firefighters themselves were taken out of there, and they remembered about the body in white already in the hospital. The situation with the search is not clear at all. There is an opinion that the personnel immediately after the accident tried to find Kodumchuk. All workers of Chernobyl NPP were nuclear physicists, and even if they were not, they should have realized that they were dealing with radiation and knew what it was. The situation was like in a war, there were no other things to do but to look for a comrade. In such an accident, it's about the same thing as a military communicator going to restore communication and disappearing, and when the whole staff drops everything and goes to look for him. That just can't happen. The shockwave drops the top cover of the reactor weighing 2,000 tons of reinforced concrete slab. From a large hole, the blast ejects parts of the reactor core, including the nuclear fuel itself and its decay products. In total, about 100 tons of red-hot radioactive mass. After that, the reactor lid falls back into place under its own weight and becomes at an angle relative to its former position, leaving a solid gap from which radioactive flames continue to shoot out. Large glowing core debris dotted the plant, some of it hitting the roof of the reactor and engine room, setting fire to the roof's bitumen. Others fall through holes in the roof and ignite the oil that spurted from broken oil pipes in the turbines and other machinery. Fires break out everywhere. The explosions completely destroyed the rooms of the main circulation pumps that provide cooling for the reactor. This wreckage was in such fields that no one had ever dug it up, neither then nor later, much less in a room that had been virtually completely turned into ruins. The explosion went all the way up and partly down, so most likely the chief machinist was not found because the remains were mixed with the construction debris and became indistinguishable from all the other rubble. Moreover, nobody wanted to dismantle the heap of radioactive graphite because it was pure suicide. According to the memories of eyewitnesses, Kodumchuk did not want to accept his, as it turned out, last shift for a very long time, clinging to formalities in the regulatory journal. He refused to put his signature, as if he had a premonition of something. Valery Kodumchuk, who fulfilled his civic duty to the end, is the only employee of the Chernobyl NPP who was killed directly in the 4th Power Unit, where he found his grave under 130 tons of concrete rubble. One famous phrase comes to my mind, 
which was once uttered by a great Russian commander, the war is not over until the last soldier is buried. I think that Kodumchuk's departure is in some sense that soldier too. The liquidation of the accident will never be fully completed until his body is committed to earth according to all the canons accepted in society. That's all for now, subscribe to the channel and leave your comments on this video.